Hello, everybody. This is Marion Waldman with Teach My Kid to Read, and I have a surprise tonight or in the morning. I have Allison Clark with me from Spellphabet, and that's from spellphabet.com. And Allison Clark is someone that I have learned from, especially early on when I was learning more about decodable books and I was watching videos. And she's got some of the most incredible lists and resources on her site. So I'm very, very excited uh, for her to, to talk with everybody. And I have a couple of questions. So first, tell us how you got involved in working with learning impaired children? Uh, well, I'm a speech pathologist and I was working in schools and um, found a lot of the kids with language impairment, um, they weren't that interested in doing all my oral language things, but they really wanted to learn to read because um, a lot of them just couldn't. They had never sort of nailed the phonology and therefore the orthography. And uh, so once I started working on that, and also there were kids with articulation problems and we were using, we have in the speech pathology world, all these funny things, you know, cued articulation and pictures for the vowels and all this. And so why don't we just use letters? because that's what you know they're going to need and use um, and found that these language impaired kids um, who were some of them were just illiterate um, came along really well and then once they had access to written language in a non-transient visual format um, that really helped their oral language and so you know they would end up you know we have these language tests where you know kids would get 50 where the average is 100 and so kids would start off at um, in my in my testing they'd start off at 50 something and then after they learned to read a couple of years later they were at 70 or eight. I had one girl was at 90 in the average range on her listening skills where her listening was terrible beforehand and I think she just hadn't mapped the words in a way um, where she could access or she I don't know what exactly it was but you know reading really boosted her language so I think um, my message to speech pathologists is you know I was told as a an undergrad don't touch reading and spelling that's teacher's role we must we must because those that reading and spelling and speaking and listening are so intertwined once you get into the school age years and um, if you can't read then that really detrimentally affects your oral language yeah, thank you. Well, that was a great, great explanation, great explanation. And so, so how do you create so many resources? I mean, ranging from videos to printouts, uh, to comprehensive listings of, of, of resources. It's, it's almost like a, what we used to call an encyclopedias. Um, well, I, I, uh, I've taken a few twists and turns in my career. And so um, I, I worked as actually, I actually worked as the state administrator for the Greens Party here. I'm a I'm a you know very obsessed with climate change as well, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I went off and became a city councillor, and I was the mayor of our local municipality for a while, which was amazing. If you ever want to find out about your entire community and how wonderful the wonderful people in it, it's a really amazing job to have. Um, and then I went, oh, I've got to put some money away for my superannuation. <laughs> So uh, I, I uh, looked at going and working in the education system again and just thought, I am so tired of, you know, in our system in education, speech pathologists are always on the periphery and we always end up in the uniform cupboard or the, you know, the corner of the library where everybody's making a lot of noise or, um, you know, and you've got, to, you've got to go from school to school carrying all this stuff and you can't remember all the codes for the photocopiers and you don't know how to work the microwave. It's just like, I am too old to do all that stuff now. And and just accommodating everybody else and you show up at a school and everybody's gone on excursion nobody told you I hate that and I want to work for, I want to have more control so I went into private practice not really being a kind of private practice person because now you know I can't really offer much in the way of services to low-income people it's got to be people with pay who can pay although our NDIS our National Disability Insurance Scheme now helps with that a bit um, so I went into private practice and then I thought, well, I'm, I work for myself now. I can say what I like. So <laughs> I didn't have any colleagues at the time. It was just me. So I thought, oh, well, I'll write a blog. And that way I can get all these things off my chest about how annoying it is that children are being taught to look at the picture and guess instead of decode, you know, and memorise books. I had all these kids who, the minute you give them a decodable book, all they do is look at the pictures and make it up. <laughs> so kids who I taught to decode and then they went off and did reading recovery and came back and they couldn't read the books they could read before. Um, yes, yeah, so I started writing this blog and now it's had 10 million hits and I don't really know how that happened. 
Um, and the nerdy thing I did, I worked with a lot of autistic children and I would say, here's the spelling rule. And then the next day they would come back and go, what about this word? What about that word? What about that word? And I'd be like, I don't really know. So um, I spent two weeks in my hammock going through the whole dictionary, sorting words. And that's where my lists came from. And they've been a real, you know, been so helpful. I hadn't realised how many people use those lists as sources for um, developing stuff. Um, yeah, so I had some time because I didn't have that many clients at first and that's why I made so many things up and I don't have as much time now, so I'm not making so many things up, sorry. But um, I am making some quizzes, which I've decided decodable quizzes are the way to go. So hopefully they'll be out soon. Oh, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing the dec decodable quizzes. So the questions are decodable you're writing the question yeah writing them question. yeah we use the sounds right teaching mm -hmm. sequence which uh -huh. um and yes yeah, so they follow that you know, they just have the code that's you know it's got is it a match and it's got a picture of a bucket or something you know, so the kids got to go yes mm -hmm. or no um so yeah because we found that i have found in COVID that kids are like oh read a whole book oh. you know you've got to remember a whole narrative it's too big it's too much whereas if it's just snappy questions and you know you do that one and then forget it and do that one and forget it so it's sentence level processing um kids are much happy to do it and read more read the same amount of text but do it more happily Oh, absolutely. So that's a great explanation and uh, no surprise about all the, the hits, hits on the blog. But one thing I wanted to ask you too is you definitely seem to indicate that it's, which we all know that it's harder to find materials for older kids struggling to read. And is that a, is that a focus of yours? Well, it was because I was working in a high school, um, had a lot of refugee kids and a lot of sort of tough kids, you know, it was one of those yeah. schools that, you know, kids, kids go where they're going to have more success than in the um, uh, schools where they're likely to be excluded. And um, so I was hunting around, you know, and I kept saying to people, let's do decodable, you know, why don't we do decodable text is just practice text for phonics. So, you know, if you're doing phonics, you've got to practice. That's all it is. It's not, there's not a special, you know, as you say, it's a crazy name. I think you said in your thing, having this name <laughs> or your interviewer said, having this name decodable text makes it sound weird, but actually it's just books that kids can read. Um, and so I started searching because people were saying, oh, no, there aren't any in the library. And in the end, that school bought a whole lot of high noon books and out chapter books, which mm -hmm. um, were useful. And um, yeah, so uh, it just turned out I went down this rabbit hole of finding good phonics resources because a lot of the stuff was too teddy bearish for my kids. And, you know, and a lot of those kids had never been to primary school, you know, they grew up in a refugee camp. And so I had to try and find a lot of different stuff and make up a lot of different stuff. A lot of them didn't even have, you know, like Somali speakers that don't have a difference between p and b. And so, you know, I had to teach them that pet is not the same as bet, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I was really scratching around for resources. And that's why I found so many things because, you know, when you go on the internet, there's a lot of stuff. It's a swamp. But if you can wade through all the trash, then you can find a lot of gold. Uh, and then it was like, oh, I should put that on a website so other people don't have to do this kind of trash sorting thing. Thank you. It's very much appreciated. And uh, I think that's something that you've done and that it really uh, around the world that all of us appreciate that there is this very, very large list of decodables and which countries you can you can order them in and and who they're for and uh we appreciate that you that that uh that you 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 find the gold and uh i i just have to say when you're talking about you know about the decodables and books that can read and and i just a a, a quick segue because i think we were talking about community programs and uh we run across phonic quote unquote phonic books a lot and i saw one with the learn uh the uh, uh an early reader for for short I and I think in one sentence it was rainbow is and uh, one of our volunteers calls those bomb words and it, you know you think well it, it's a wonder you know our kids are struggling so much to read mm -hmm. but uh, really it is just books that kids can read and uh, mm -hmm. to be able to have the listings and have them at the different skill levels and and be able to find the resources for for older kids uh definitely mm -hmm. thank you and to get back to uh now your lovely your wonderful wonderful uh website which has i say i always say it has so much uh it has breadth and depth 
which is a hard balance. And that's yeah, and it's, it's, I didn't know when I started setting it up, it would be so hard to maintain. It's like, oh, I'm up late, like fixing broken links. And oh. <laughs> so sorry to everybody who, if you go, oh, that's up, not up to date. I'm doing my best and we've got our summer holidays coming and there will be time to do a bit better. <laughs> Well, we, I think we all understand that anybody who those, those broken links, but uh, so what are your major goals for the, the, the Spellphabet website at uh, this point? Well, uh, to encourage um, the teachers and, you know, the teams of kids who are beginning to read and kids who are struggling to read, I think there's sort of two cohorts, um, to teach in accordance with the best available evidence, which is not um, high frequency, rote learning high frequency word lists. That sends a whole lot of children down the wrong sort of rabbit holes. It's not predictable text. We have in schools, we have a lot of schools have the Fontas and Pinnell predictable readers and PM readers we have here. Um, those kind of, you know, look at the picture and guess, memorise the text kind of books really are so bad for the kids who are inclined to not be able to crack the code you know the crack the code kids will be fine whatever you do pretty much but a lot of kids if they don't have that explicit direct um, instruction and the practice they just end up in no they just go off it's you know Pam Snow from here and one of our um, local academics she says it's like you know on, a, on the launching pad um, if you're a little bit out of alignment on the launching pad, that doesn't seem too bad, but you can end up miles off in space. And that's exactly where so many of the kids that come through this door have just been sent off into space with guessing and memorising. And, uh, and also alphabetic phonics, is it drives me nuts, this thing of just look at the first letter in a word. I mean, you have to read right through the word to be able to get it. And this idea that you can look at the first letter and guess the rest, I mean, it's very in, ingrained in multi-queuing type teaching. Um, but it's a disaster, this idea that you read a word by just sort of looking at the outside bits. You have to look at all of it. You have to take it apart and put it back together and lock it in. You know? <laughs> and once you've locked it in, you lock it in now when you're six, and then it's locked in until you're 90. And every time you see that word, even if you don't want to read it, you still will. Um, so this um, emphasis on getting teachers to understand that we've just got to get rid of those practices that are not serving the lowest kids in terms of the kids with the poorest phonemic awareness. And um, we've really got to screen for things like rapid naming early on and just change around how hey, we do the first couple of years of school. And, uh, you know, then so, so many of the kids who would end off miles off in space are going to be on the right sort of trajectory to then be able to self-teach and um, be able to access more. Like, at, now, do you know, it's funny before, um, you said Ad Adirondacks. How do you say that? Adirondacks. Adirondacks. I've been saying that wrong for my whole life. My goodness. I think I read that in some book about horses when I was about six. <laughs> no, I don't know. You know, maybe 10. I don't know. I've been sad, saying ad iron dax. That's wrong, isn't it? That's the first time I've heard that word said. Well, <laughs> now I've mapped it. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, because I was a kid who learned a lot of words from books, I just had so many words wrong. I once said to a pediatrician that somebody was quite stoic. Because that's wrong, stoic. Oops. <laughs> it, because, you know, you get your vocab from books, but, you know, it's a reverse. It starts off going um, speech to print and then you flip it and you can get um, words into your vocab from reading. But sadly, if you never hear them, you don't say them right sometimes. No, oh, absolutely. We have a librarian. I think I'm going to show her interview next week. And she kept saying it's Appalachian, Appalachian, because we say Appalachian, which was is different than what she was actually talking about. And when we, when I introduced her, I still said Appalachian. <laughs> and she yeah. mostly just it, ignored it. But uh, it's, uh, it's a good illustration. If you map it wrong, it's very hard to unmap it. So let's get yes. kids mapping them right from the start, you know. Um, but the pronunciation, you know, if you say something a wrong way, well, that's not such a bad thing. I mean, I still know about those mountains. You know, I learned about them when I was little. But um, uh, you, you can you can sort of fix that, but it's harder if it's mapped wrong. Uh, let's give kids the tools to map it correctly by giving them the, you know, the comprehension and the, the oral language, you know, yes. reading the stories and all that sort of stuff. So they've heard so many words and they're ready to, they're in, they've got all these words in their phonological memory. So when they meet them in print, they can go, oh, snap. And, you know, start to um, hoover them up 
Um, but yeah, if you don't um, if you don't have the code, then you can't do that. You can't do that thing of snapping the words that you meet in print onto the ones you've heard in your stories or your conversations or whatever. Um, yeah, and it happened that my family never talked about your mountains. <laughs> yes, no, well, uh, well, now it, it's it, we'll just keep saying Adirondack, Adirondack, and it, Adirondack, it, Adirondack. I'm going to go off and I'm going to write it down in phonetic script. <laughs> I'll have a kayak waiting for you in the southern end. <laughs> I'm not getting the emphasis on the wrong syllable again. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, this brings up our last question is really I'm talking from two sides of the planet on two different days, matter of fact. How can more of us join forces to help all kids learn to read? Do you know, I think we are. I really think we are. There's this sort of community around the world now. There's people in the UK who've sort of had a mandated phonics system in early years, but it's still, it's difficult to change. It, they say it takes six years to change a culture, you know, really change it in a way where it won't just change back the minute you pull out the people who are doing the changing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's a lot of people who are really slogging away and little by little taking down the things that don't work and putting up things that do work and um, really networking. I mean, it's amazing that we, we haven't met before, but hey, <laughs> here we are. Um, and, you know, when I first started talking about this and then ran into, you know, we have a lovely um, woman who does the Little Learners Love Literacy books here, um, Maureen Pollard. And uh, I remember she and I went to the pub one day early on and, and just went, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, there, there is this sort of, my goodness, you get me, you know, you get this thing that I really want to, I really, this problem I see and I want to fix and the Reading League people get it. And, the, you know, I, I had to put a list of change makers up on my um, website. Um, and if you know any other change makers who should be on there, <laughs> because I think it is a force to be reckoned with now. Um, that so many people in so many different places are chipping away at this and, uh, and networking with each other and supporting and encouraging each other. Um, so I think, um, yeah, we're, we're already doing it. And, um, you know, we, we each go and do our little corner of the world yes. and do what we can to, to um, change it. You know, a lot of the time I'm at the therapy coalface and I've got these kids who have been taught in a whole lot of ways that haven't helped them. And then I've got to try and reverse that. And at the end of the day, it's like exhausting. <laughs> do I really want to do this forever? No. <laughs> you know, I could go off and work in autism spectrum again. I could go off and work. You know, there's so many other things I want to do in my life. Let's hurry up and fix this problem because it's so annoying that so many people have poor literacy. It shows up in the data and we have to make that change. Yes. Well, well said. And so here we are uh, from New York to Melbourne, Australia, and uh, we're connected and we're going to be connecting more people and your work is uh, very valued. It, influenced, uh, it, it influences the information we can provide to parents and librarians. And I'm sure a lot of people in this group watching today have used your resources and lists. So thank you so much for, for, for being here tonight. And uh, I look forward to further conversations. Yeah, thank 